Hi, my name is Take Mura. Um, very nice to be here. Let me talk about designing the global window. This is my theme, but the, uh, what is the global window all about? So, uh, to illustrate this concept, I will show you uh, some of my project, but the, uh, let me first invite you to my homeland, Japan, Kyoto. You're listening to the special sound of water drop. This is the sound of a special musical device set on in Kyoto. Um, this sound comes from a traditional Japanese garden ornament and musical device called Suikinkutsu in a 700-year-old Buddhist temple in Kyoto. As rainwater seeps into a buried ceramic pot underground, the drops fall and resonate like this, in creating this sound. And please note that this is not pre-recorded, but rather the actual sound of water in the temple in Kyoto at this very moment. That means we are listening to the sound in real time. We are connected from this venue to Kyoto through the internet. So listen to this sound. You're listening to the Kyoto because I set the kind of internet stethoscope in that temple. That's why you're listening to this sound. Stethoscope placed on the other side of the globe. This is our web project called Aquascape. We have just begun it last autumn uh, as one of the projects of our exhibition on water focusing on the global environmental issue of water. So far, we have placed microphones in this temple, Kyoto in Tokyo, and Mumbai in India. So you can listen to the sound of Mumbai real time through the net. Uh, afterwards, please try. And I hope there is one in Africa, so why not in this Cape Town? Let me show you another uh, project of myself. Um, you saw the uh, sunset in Tokyo and maybe a sun is rising on the other hand and then somewhere like in the uh, American continent. So uh, this is again the real time uh, program. The earth is constantly rotating. Somewhere people are greeting the sunrise and on the other side of the planet, others are enjoying the sunsets. There's a poem, a very famous poem in Japan, uh, Morning Relay, that describes how we are all connected to each other invisibly through this relay of sunrise and sunset from longitude to longitude. So we designed this a kind of software, or uh, we call it sensor, to enable, user, enable users to feel this global connectivity or connectedness in real time. Uh, so, as you can see, um, our project began from the desire to design platforms to help us grasp the realities of this global era designing the public pla sensory platform on the net. The nature of mass media is to report that which is extraordinary, but what we need is to share the simple feelings and ordinary life of people across the globe. Sharing the context, not the text, but context of the news events is vital. And our sensibilities are imaginations are far from being global. Our economies are globalized, but our media environments have yet to be made compatible with the realities of global lifestyle. Globalism is not just about joining the international community, it's rather about recognizing our planet as a whole, as a globe. So we need the system to help us monitor the dynamism of the Earth in real time, or we need media for sharing the context among us. 
Well, it was about 12 years ago uh, that I first engaged this kind of uh, project, engaged myself in this uh, creative work to design global windows. Then I produced Sensorium, an experimental web project, which won the Arcet Electronica Golden Nika. And Breathing Girls is one of the outstanding program in that program. So let me show you some of this. Breathing Earth is a program which monitors seismic activity, that means an earthquake, around the world every day. In Japan, we ex experienced in the previous year a big earthquake in Kobe. And what I recognized through the disaster is not the threat of earthquake itself, but the vulnerability of our urban society and the lack of sensitivity and imagination to the dynamics of living earth. So I was ashamed of this insensitiveness as a, pe as a people who live on such a always fluctuating and breathing island in Japan. That's why I decided to create the window to visualize their virtual self-portrait of this living earth to make ourselves more sensitive. But what's important here is not the computer graphics output, but rather the fact that here exists an actual portrait of the Earth based on observational data from seismic recorders globally, as frequently updated through the internet. I was so excited when I first found the seismic database on the net, incessantly updated in real time. So I planned the uh, automatic uh, compilation system to plot these actual data on the virtual globe like this, on the web, so that the self-portrait of the Earth is automatically updated. And through this project we got three big ideas. First, it is a high time to make the visualization and monitoring of our living planet available to everyone traveling on spaceship Earth. Second, we can feel connected as though we have extended our nervous system in a global embrace. And third, to recognize the whole as a bottom up process, just as a single puzzle, we can create the whole image of the living Earth through connecting and collecting the small pieces of the local seismic data through the internet. I develop later tangible earth. え、この地球儀のサイズは1000万分の1、実際1、実際の地球の1000万分の1、つまり直径11800km の地球がちょうど1.28m の。It reflects data such as the real-time terminator and the position of the Earth to the sun and where the light and shade of the day and night are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can see the terminator, and it's a real time. So, uh, if you, if there were a uh, tangible earth here, you will see the uh, terminator is on, um, where uh, about the, on Japan now, and seven hours later, uh, that will come to the uh, here South Africa. Um, and uh, it can show uh, various contents like the uh, almost real-time cloud movement, global warming, I will show you later, and uh, typhoon, tsunami, earthquakes. But uh, what is important here is that we are trying to achieve with this project um, something quite different from the Google Earth, for example. Um, we want to communicate a tangible sense of our planet. 
to feel the earth as one globe, one living orb, to bring the entire globe into view, to turn it around interactively and observe. By doing these things, the user can look at the world from any perspective, be it their hometown in Cape Town, <coughs> the North Pole, South Pole, Japan. They are encouraged to imagine things happening interrelated around the globe. And the scale, 10 million to 1 of the planet's actual size, is an important part of the information design of this project. For example, the troposphere and the layer of the air blanketing the Earth up to 10,000 meters, up to where jets fly, become only one millimeter thick on this globe. One millimeter thick, the air of the layer. So even a child can see how fragile our layer of the air is. And uh, here you can see the, uh, the typhoons and other uh, dynamic activities. On the, and these clouds are all confined in the one millimeter thick, thin layer of the Earth. So you can intuitively grasp and this is the uh, serpentile uh, secrets, the uh, black, uh, black stream or gulf stream, or like that. Um, and we think it's important to combine digital technology and analog tactility or tangibility to create more substantial and transformative relationship to knowledge. The next generation, what needs to come after the 20th century digital technology are platforms which better address these analog faculties unique to humans. Um, Here is a seismic event and the uh, tsunami caused by the big earthquake. And what happens in Sri Lanka? Uh, there is a magnifying glass on this globe, so uh, you can use this mag digital magnifying glass to look at what happens in certain location. And you can spin like this. And, and this. <laughs> so why don't you have one in next in Java? <laughs> see the deforestation of in Thailand. And you can see the shape of the Thailand from the space. Normally you don't see the uh, borderline or the shape of the country from the space. But you will see how the deforestation is going on. And it's a, a trace of the uh, migratory birds. Uh, Trace from the GPS uh, by the GPS, and, uh, and you can make it real time uh, if you uh, try. And uh, this is the uh, movement of the air pollutants uh, going beyond the national border. Uh, actually, uh, there are many. Um, we have sometimes the. Uh, so-called photochemical smogs in Japan, but the, uh, the air pollutants are coming from China or Russia, or, you know, uh, so uh, it's no use to make a regulation in national basis. And it's a really an international, global matter. You can, even a child can see. The yellow shows the uh, CO, and uh, the blue color shows the, uh, the movement of the SOX and green uh, NOX and these are moving around the globe like this and also you can see the uh, global, war global warming process it's a data of, uh, by Earth Simulator uh, in Japan and it shows the uh, change of the temperature on the Earth uh, from 1950s to uh, to uh, 2100. It's an express version of the uh, uh, global warming process. Uh, 
10 years for one second <laughs> and uh, uh, I started around 2050 that means uh, 40 years later from now and uh, especially um, if the uh, temperature goes up uh, right for 3 degrees uh, it gets red and uh, uh, 6 degrees it gets uh, yellow and especially uh, you can see that the uh, polar area, North Pole and uh, Tibet, Himalaya is very fragile and vulnerable to the global warming uh, because uh, they, have, uh, uh, they are covered with ice and the ice has an albedo effect but the, if the global warming uh, proceed and uh, the ice melt, the uh, albedo effect decrease and the uh, global warming process acceler is accelerated too much but yeah, these kind of things is no, no use to uh, explain to the children, but even the children can see how uh, the global warming process is quite different from uh, one place to each uh, to another. And uh, you, especially these areas are so fragile and vulnerable to the global warming process. Well, these, um, I, as you listen to the uh, sound of the uh, uh, temple in Kyoto and uh, this kind of a project is uh, what we call the media for the uh, online presence, to media to feel uh, the online presence and the, uh, for the context awareness um, idea of bringing out the uh, broadband in people's imagination. Um, we often see the news of the overseas wars and terrorist strikes, but we don't often feel that these things are our own personal problems. But if we were to hear the actual sound of individuals screaming or the sirens in real time through this kind of global stethoscope on the internet, we would completely change our emotional response to these tragedies. Because it's uh, real time, so it's unpredictable. And actually, I often uh, hear the uh, another sound other than the uh, water drops. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, voice of the kids or a uh, uh, bird song. And uh, sometimes I wonder uh, what kind of language is that you know, when we, especially listening to the sound of the Mumbai in India. So uh, this kind of uh, um, unpredictable unpredictability it creates a sound sense of feeling connected with the other side of the world. What we need to design is much more, um, much such uh, sensewear or programs which cause us to get higher resolution in our imagination. I tried some uh, social experiment in the uh, Expo uh, 2005 to make a, to design a global window of the, such a, a online presence and context awareness. Um, this is called Global Corridor Project. Um, I put the uh, digital globe at the center of the venue and uh, in the Global Citizens Pavilion and around it we built several monitors, real-time global uh, windows connected to locations around the globe, each divided by one hour time difference uh, by internet video chats. And we met children from countries which could not participate in the expo, such as Cambodia and Afghanistan. I didn't want to make the first expo of the 21st century, one that hadn't evolved from the 19th century. Just people, objects, and people and objects from all around the world gathered in the fairground of the pavilions. And that is why I thought about the uh, ideas of designing windows over, all over the world to enable participation the uh, expo, expo via the internet. It was to connect the whole world as an expo venue, and that should be the real global expo, not by collection of goods, but the connection of global citizens. So uh, like this and uh, this is the uh, captured uh, pictures of the uh, uh, 
global windows. Uh, we have been talking about talking to the uh, kids in Afghanistan, Cambodia, like this for 180 days. Well, in the end, all not all the countries can participate equally in events like in the Expo. Uh, there is economic disparities and you know, vis visual disparities. And so, actually, the president of the school who participated in this project from Afghanistan told me, Japanese kids always talk to the children in Afghanistan, and that made us feel that we are not forgotten and connected from the world uh, to the world and uh, part, uh, part of the global society. Um, it was actually a September 11th that motivated me to this project. Um, I was, of course, shocked by the terrorism itself, but at the same time, we were shocked by the, uh, what's happened afterwards. So, but if we have environments where we can see the location, children playing around as normal part of everyday life, like this, in the cafe or restaurant in each uh, main cities around the world, I'm sure that we wouldn't rush into bombing them so rashly. Um, so the key to stable global peace might not be in politics or ideology, but by designing effectual information environments. Then our global corridor was a humble first step to realize this vision, but why not these systems at ground zero? That's what I thought. Now you're watching the uh, movement of the uh, Cherry Blossom Front uh, going up north of the J Japan Archipelago. Um, I'm talking about the, uh, the third point of the uh, uh, to recognize the whole through the bottom of the process. And uh, one example is this uh, uh, Sakura scape or Cherry Blossom scape. Um, scape. Um, you saw the uh, express, express ver version of the uh, animation of the uh, movement of uh, Sakura Front. Um, so Sakura scape is the example uh, of my, this project, um, which is re uh, a kind of real-time map of where in Japan, where in Japan the cherry blossoms have begun blossoming and cold fronts recede north. In practice, it is an aggregate of images uh, which people have posted from their cell phones. In Japan, cell phones are commonly used as mobile internet terminals and people frequently exchange emails, view websites and blogs with them. And on the other hand, cherry blossoms are harbinger of spring for the Japanese and when they blossom it is our tradition to get together and party under them, singing and improvising haiku, a kind of poem with 17 syllables. The Sakura Scape is an internet portal uh, we developed for showing haiku on cherry blossoms submitted with photo via cell phones and these pictures are then automatically updated onto a map of Japan. The server places the location of the images by zip code that they email when posting. Um, it looks dark, but it's because now in Japan it's dark outside. It's in the night. The point of this program is to archive people's cherry blossom experience in real time, while at the same time visualizing the uh, macroscopic movement of the cherry blossom <coughs> front as it moves north up to the, uh, to the Japanese archipelago. By checking this site every day, the user can follow posts from different locations in real time and feel engaged in the change of the season. You can follow from the first they bloom in South Okinawa today post through the front line across Tokyo today and to, it reached Hokkaido, the northern island, like that. It's a bulletin board for cherry blossoms on a global scale. Um, what you saw here 
is an express version, a uh, condensed version of the uh, phone line movement, three months compressed into uh, 30 seconds. But the, uh, the cherry blossom season is about to start in Japan in, in a month, so uh, you will watch the uh, movement of the cherry blossom front on the web, even if you live in South Africa. <coughs> And the point also is that it's a whole picture of Japan created by bottom-up process, like pieces of jigsaw puzzle contribute by individual real-time reports from various locations. Your own experiences compo of composing haiku inspired by cherry blossom at certain locations are connected with other people's experience as relayed through time and space. Sakuraski is driven by desires to participate and to connect to each other. It's also a kind of sociological experiment of visualizing a whole out of voluntary collaborations of individual parts and of realizing a sense of big global change blossom out of the chaining of an enormous change blossom festival. And so I hope in, in two years or three years um, I'd like to develop this project in a global scale so that we could share the uh, synchronic blossom event worldwide. So uh, let me show you another um, map called the uh, AgriScape. AgriScape, I was to uh, show you some of the uh, uh, map of uh, excellent farmers in Japan uh, who is thinking much of the uh, sustainability and organic agriculture. Uh, and uh, these are also collected from the cell phones. And the uh, vivid voices of the agri uh, farmers are collected on the map. One more project uh, I've uh, recently launched is the uh, water exhibition uh, with the uh, designer Sato Taku. Uh, <coughs> this is the uh, ex exhibition which I directed last autumn. Um, I designed the fun device to visualize the great volumes of water consumption hidden behind the food uh, we consume every day. This would include all of the uh, water employed in growing, feeding, and washing and processing it before it arrives to the consumer. And we call it virtual water sometimes, especially in the context of the food trade, food international trade. My device here was uh, called a virtual water server. It looked like a typical ticket vending machine for a cafeteria, but in this case, your ticket doesn't carry the price in money, but in virtual water, uh, the amount of water needed to produce meal you order. For example, one hamburger costs 2,000 liters of water. In order to produce one kilogram wheat or corn, for example, you consume 2,000 times that means 2,000 kilograms, 2,000 liters of water. And in order to produce beef by feeding oxen by these uh, corns, for example, water need, uh, the amount of water needed is uh, 20,000 liters. That's why the one ham hamburger costs 2,000 liters uh, of water. I believe it is one of our generation's most important tasks to design information uh, environments that throw light on the many black boxes in our society and learn to visualize the global economic structure which our life is based on. To use information technologies as nerve system which enables global society to create sustainability, sustainable information feed feedback. Uh, loop, um, sustainable information feedback loops between each one of us and our environment. In any case, um, designing information shouldn't be just about making it beautiful with graphics and packing. Cool web design is not very meaningful if it never affects anything outside our computer display. Lastly, I would like to introduce uh, another type of the experiment of social wear, uh, software, social software, Ubiquitous Museum.
東京・丸の内といえば近代的なオフィス街というイメージがありその歴史や文化に目が向けられることはあまりないかもしれませんでもこの丸の内実は一つ一つの通りや建物に物語がいっぱい詰まった街全体が博物館のようなところなんです例えばここ日比谷この携帯ナビによれば400年前江戸時代の初期まではなんと海だったそうです浅瀬に海苔を養殖する竹のひびがいっぱい立っていたのでひびやこの場所が海だったなんて意外ですねさて私がこうして使っている携帯ナビ実は東京丸の内指揮立つミュージアムというサイトなんです自分の携帯を街の歴史や隠された物語を発見する虫眼鏡のように使って街を歩いていこうという仕組みですこの携帯ナビにはいろいろな入り方があります例えばこんな風に街の中を歩いている時にここはどんなところだろうこの場所にはどんな物語が隠されているんだろうそう思った時には目印を探してくださいあちょうどあそこにも目印がありますねこの QR コードこのマークを探してくださいそして携帯を使ってマークを読み取りますするとそれだけでこのようにその場所の観光情報や隠れた物語を引き出すことができるんですまた GPS 携帯をお持ちの方なら「今いる場所を検索」を選択すぐに自分がいる場所の地図とともに周辺の情報がいろいろ飛び込んできます自分が今いる場所の情報にすぐにアクセスできる携帯ナビ「指きたすミュージアム」もうガイドブックを持って歩く必要もありませんねさらにこの携帯ナビのポイントは用意されている情報を見るというだけではなくユーザー自身が情報を追加してコンテンツを作っていけるというユーザー参加型のシステムだという点なんです例えばこの場所には置き手紙があるみたいですね見てみましょううわあこんな隠れたスポットがあるんですねあミレナリオの思い出を書いた置き手紙もありますわあ綺麗ですねこのようにこれまで一方通行だった情報がユーザー参加型で時と場所を超えて行き来することで街の記憶のデータベースが生きた形で作られていくことになります単なる観光の街歩きに終わらず街の中で新たな発見やつながりが生まれていくような仕組みそれが東京丸の内指揮たすミュージアムです Uh, for example,、uh, when you are walking、uh, around、uh, Tokyo Central Area,、uh, it's called Hibiya, and the,、uh, <coughs> the place used to be underwater until、uh, 400 years ago, for example.、Uh, this kind of information you can get、uh, through your cell phone,、uh, GPS located. And,、uh, so, this is my.、Uh, Idea to use the cell phone as a magnifying glass to read the hidden story in each site.、Um, so, the digital terrestrial globe、uh, I introduced earlier is a centripetal medium which concentrates information from the whole world into a one meter sphere. On the contrary, this ubiquitous museum is centrifugal medium. Which distributes information to make physical experience more profound, turning the entire planet into a living museum or a living repository of embedded knowledge. So, once upon a time, humanity had theater type media such as libraries, museums, and churches. There was the innovation, information innovation at that time, around 2000 years ago or something. And later, we developed package type media thanks to Gutenberg.、Uh, 
printed matter such as books. And now we have ubiquitous media uh, which allows us to develop our cities as living texts, a living museum. Uh, perhaps these are the first steps towards the next information revolution. But it, its purpose is not only to pro provide a historical knowledge and touristic information, but rather through knowing that, for example, this place was under the sea. It encourages us to see our everyday world in slightly different ways. It encourages us to wondering where the shore was, when the city was created. So my conception of information technology design is to develop tools and systems that make people more sensitive rather than to create too convenient technology uh, like car navigation or tunnel that eliminate the need for thinking. Technology exists to enable human potential, information technology, to expand our creativity. Why build a society where things begin and end by simply pressing the button? That's an IT society geared to fooling us humans. I think now is the dawn of human-oriented civilization. The more artificial intelligence and robotics develop, the more our attention closes in on how high our information processing capabilities are, both in our brains and bodies. So, uh, it's been five million years since humans started to walk upright and 50 thousands of years since Homo sapiens left Africa to spread across the world. Now, for the first time in our history, time has come when we have a chance to re-evaluate our unique creativity and use it as a social resource to design more humane civilization. I hope that the dawn of the new civilization based on human creativity will one day come again from here in Africa. Thank you very much.